Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and today we're back in Johto for possibly the most ambitious challenge I've ever done. We are asking the question, can you beat Pokemon Crystal without using items or Pokemon centers? The obvious exception is made for key items and HMs, but other than that, we are on our own. No Pokeballs, no potions, no TMs, no Nurse Joy. There's no loophole here either. We also aren't allowed to heal using the machine in Elm's lab. It's that simple. Well, it's not simple, but the idea is. You get what I mean. People complained that the last challenge was too easy. I am not looking for any complaints here. Okay, let's get into it. Choosing Totodile for our starter is necessary because of HMs, so we take one, name her Magnolia, and take away her berry. Seems kind of mean in retrospect, but that is the nature of this video. The start of this challenge is incredibly slow. We get a free heal after visiting Mr. Pokemon, and another after beating our rival. We need to take full advantage of them. Luckily, there is one Pokemon in the early routes that doesn't have any attacks. During the day, there's a 5% chance of running into Hoppip, who only knows Splash and Synthesis. We need to take down as many as we can. After our third Hoppip, Magnolia levels up to 7 and learns Rage. Number 27 gets us up to level 13, where Totodile adds Water Gun to her arsenal. We head back to Route 46 to battle some Geodude, and then struggle as much as we can without fainting. Then it's finally time to meet Mr. Pokemon and Professor Oak. Oak heals us up, and then it's time to get back to grinding. A Caterpie goes down and levels Magnolia up to 18, evolving her into Croconaw in the process. I don't think many people evolve their starter before the first rival battle, but I feel like it is necessary here. Once Struggle gets us low on HP, it's time to do that battle. We only have 8 HP, but it's good enough to take out Chikorita without knocking ourselves out. Our rival heals us up, but that's it for a while. In case it wasn't obvious, we can't use the PC to heal Pokemon either. If I deposit a Pokemon, it can't come out of the PC until we get a free heal. After talking to Professor Elm and our mom, we head out on our journey. I'm just going to leave in all of the footage from Cherry Grove up to Faulkner, because it didn't take too long. When you've played Crystal as much as I have, I feel like it's almost impossible not to plot this path and pick up every item. I don't really need them, but at least I can sell them and make some money. We can't use it right now, but we might find something for it later. As you may have guessed, the Violet City Gym Leader doesn't put up much of a fight. Magnolia obliterates everyone in the gym and earns us the Zephyr Badge. When we leave the gym, Professor Elm calls us and tells us to pick up the egg from the Pokemon Center. We run around for a bit to hatch our Togepi and name him Spectre. Then, it's time for Sprout Tower. It's another easy task for Magnolia at her level, but if we didn't grind early on, this would have been the end of our challenge. There are a lot of skippable trainers here, and we're gonna be taking advantage of it. Sagely's Hoot Hoot had a chance to get a hit in, but decided to use Foresight instead. Right now, we're at max HP with only a fifth of our attacking PP gone. We're in pretty good shape. Alright, onwards to Azalea. I actually made it all the way to Azalea without taking on any trainers, but realized that was pointless with the free heal coming up soon. Backtracking through Union Cave and Route 32 to take down everyone didn't take too long. Once we're done, we can meet up with Kurt in Azalea Town and then follow him to Slowpoke Well to get rid of Team Rocket. For what it's worth, the concept of climbing down a well is straight up terrifying. My suggestion to Kurt was that we just pour some gasoline down there and spam Metronome with Togepi until he lands a fire type move. Although he agreed it would deal with Team Rocket, he seemed a bit concerned about the slowpoke, so down the well we go. We push through the first few rockets, but before taking on the final rocket grunt, we stop for another grinding session. There's a free heal coming after beating him, but that's our last one until Mahogany Town, so we have to make it count. We manage to get Magnolia up to 24, and Spectre up to level 12 before finishing up in slowpoke well. It's a stroke of luck that we're getting a free heal right now, because coughing poisons Croconaw during the battle, and that's just about impossible to deal with in this situation. With Team Rocket gone and our team healed up, we're free to go after our second gym badge. With Magnolia up there in levels, getting through the gym is pretty simple. Bugsy's team isn't able to cause much trouble either. Kakuna and Metapod are simple tasks, and Scyther takes three hits to knock out, but even with that, he doesn't do much damage to Magnolia. After earning the Hive Badge, we immediately have to face off with our rival. Ghastly isn't a problem as Magnolia knows Bite, but Bayleaf's Razor Leaf could be dangerous with its high critical hit ratio. We decide to go with Togepi and hope for some luck with Metronome. Bayleaf's Growl lets us get in a free hit, but Metronome becomes Twister and doesn't do too much damage. 
then a crit razor leaf wipes out Spectre. It's unfortunate because I think we would have lived a normal hit. Karma comes back around right away though as Bayleaf goes for Growl and Poison Powder against Magnolia and both moves fail. Zubat is able to get a hit in on Croconaw, but overall this battle has gone well. After it's over, we deposit Spectre to the PC and make our way through Ilex Forest. To make it through, we have to teach Cut to someone, and as Magnolia is our only Pokemon, we replace Rage. Once we reach Goldenrod, it's time for some team building. Our first new member comes in the form of an egg from the daycare center. We pick up a bike and cycle around until our egg hatches into a Smoochum. We name her Wanda, wish she was an Elekid, and then head north. Inside this building, what are these even called? Crossing centers? I don't know. This guy gives us a Spearow called Kenya. We promise to deliver him to a man on Route 31 with the mail attached. Um, I'm sure we'll get around to it at some point. Maybe. Then it's time to head underground and grab the coin case so we can buy some new team members. We purchase a thousand coins and then add Dia the Cubone, Tradesy the Abra, and Barra the Abra to our growing group. You may be thinking that Tradesy is a terrible nickname, but that Abra is getting swapped for another Pokemon with a terrible nickname, so it's only fair. Let's meet Muscle the Machop. With that trade done, we have a full team of six to grind up. The quick session was enough to get Muscle up to 14, Wanda up to 8, Kenya up to 16, Dia up to 17, and Magnolia up to 27. Barra didn't level up at all because of teleport, and the fact that switch training in this challenge is pretty redundant. Only Dia took significant damage, which isn't ideal, but we'll work around it. Next up is Whitney's Gym. This is a terrifying prospect. Miltank could stop this run in its tracks if things don't go our way. We're planning to use Machop, so she's being used against all of the gym trainers. We actually make it all of the way to the Goldenrod Gym Leader, with only 10 HP missing, which is pretty solid. Whitney's Clefairy goes down after two Karate Chops, but her Double Slap takes Muscle down to 34 HP. Miltank leads off with Rollout, which is both good and bad. Machop does resist it, but if she can't defeat Miltank, then we may well lose three or more Pokemon. Our second Karate Chop is a critical hit which almost takes her down before the third hit of Rollout knocks Machop down to just 2 HP. A final shot knocks out Miltank and earns us the Plane Badge. Just. We then head to Route 36 to get rid of the Sudowoodo who's been blocking the road. One low kick does a bit of damage, but Magnolia makes it out fine. After meeting Bill in Ecritique, we head back to Goldenrod, put Abra in the PC, and add Eevee to take his place. We nickname him Varia, and then return to Ecritique to take on the Kimono Girls. In a few of the battles, we did have to go back and reload an old save because of terrible luck thanks to moves like Stand Attack. In the end, we got through without losing anyone, which I'll definitely take. Our victory earns us the HM for Surf, which we teach to Magnolia after exhausting Water Gun's PP. Before taking on Silver and Morty, we head west to Route 38 to level up a bit. The essential goal here was to get Pokemon who can take on Bayleaf and Gengar, so we're trying to evolve Kenya and Magnolia. After a few battles, Croconaw reaches level 30 and evolves into Feraligator. Then back in the National Park, Spearow gets up to 20 and evolves into Vero. With that done, we can head back to Ecritique and take on our rival. Magnolia comfortably takes down Haunter and Magnemite, but we have a minor issue with Bayleaf. To get Kenya up to 20, we've had to use Peck a lot. At this point, we only have two PP left. As a result, we have to soak up a few hits so we can lower his defense enough with Leer to take him down in just two shots. Kenya does it, surviving with 12 HP. Silver's final Pokemon, Zubat, actually lives on one HP after cut, but Supersonic makes no difference as we get lucky and break through confusion. Our rival is beaten once again, and now we're going after the Ecritique Gym Leader. As we prepare to take on Morty, our team is looking noticeably shaken. Wanda is level 8 and out of PP, Varia is too weak right now to do much damage, and Daya, Muscle, and Kenya are all nearing death's door. Only Magnolia is really fit for battle right now. Luckily, Feraligator is a beast. She wipes out Morty's entire team without getting hit, earning us our fourth gym badge. Then it's time to add another new team member as Wanda is becoming increasingly useless. We now have enough money to buy some more coins and get ourselves a Wobbuffet. We nickname him Jabadiah and then surf east from Ecritique because Mahogany Town is where our next free heal is coming from. Before we get there though, we have to visit the Lake of Rage and battle the Red Gyarados rampaging there. Unfortunately, we can't run, so Magnolia has to absorb some powerful hits. Once he's knocked out, we meet up with Lance by the lakeside. 
The Dragon Master wants our help with Team Rocket in Mahogany, and as he's the source of our next heal, we agree to join him. We shut off the sensors in the hideout, but we have plenty to do before heading downstairs. We need to do as much as possible before getting healed up. First on our list is the lighthouse in Olivine. We sweep through and meet Jasmine on the top floor, who sends us onwards to Cianwood in search of medicine. For now, our team is still in decent shape. After picking up the secret potion, we decide to check out the Cianwood City Gym. With Jebediah at full health, we let him loose against the first two gym trainers. At level 15, Jebediah obliterates the level 27 Hitmonlee with counter, and then takes Hitmonchan down with mirror coat. Wobbuffet is a monster. Unfortunately, Machop's seismic toss is just enough to take him out. What a performance, though. Magnolia wipes out the last two gym trainers, and we put Jebediah in the PC so we can pick up another free Pokemon. Shucky the Shuckle. Even though the team is looking pretty weak, we decide to try our luck with Chuck. His only two Pokemon are Primeape and Poliwrath, and they shouldn't be too much trouble for Feraligatr. Primeape just about survives through Surf, and uses Leer which could become a problem against Poliwrath. Luckily, he misses his Dynamic Punch, and a crit strength gets us through the battle without taking a hit. We earn ourselves a Storm Badge, and then head outside to talk to Chuck's wife. She gives us the HM for Fly, which we immediately teach to Kenya. We fly back to Olivine and give Jasmine the cure for Ampharos, and she returns to her gym. We aren't going to push our luck any further, though. But we do have a grinding session in front of us before healing up in Mahogany. During that, we do have to return to Route 30 and find a Hoppip so we can wake up Varia without taking any damage. Then we ran into Raikou with Shuckle at the front of the party, and just used Constrict for the hell of it. I want you to all take a second to picture a little Shuckle trying to Constrict a legendary beast. Done? Good. After spending an inordinate amount of time cycling around Goldenrod to raise Varia's happiness, we level him up to 21 and get a brand new Espeon for our team. Unfortunately, he'll be almost entirely useless until level 36 when he learns Psybeam. For now, we're stuck with just Tackle. That's about it for the grinding, we got a few levels here and there, and battled until we didn't have any HP or PP to go further. Then Lance heals us right back up. That's our final heal in Johto, so we need to be pretty careful from here on out. I just want you to all keep in mind that this is only the second heal up since beating Silver's level 5 Chikorita, and aside from HMs and key items, we haven't used a single item. This team is doing amazingly. Anyway, speaking of the team, as we've been healed, we can use our PC for once, so we're going to swap Shucky out for Jebediah. Then we're heading back to Olivine for our gym battle with Jasmine. I wanted to get this out of the way while we were at full health, expecting a tough test from Steelix. Magnolia just demolished our whole team though. One Surf was enough to deal with each of Jasmine's Pokemon and earn us the Mineral Badge. Then we head back to the Rocket Hideout in Mahogany. None of the grunts inside do anything to stop us, and we finish off the area with a pre-double battle, double battle, where we just take on a rocket admin while Lance battles a different admin standing next to us. Daya, Kenya, and Magnolia make light work of the Team Rocket member. We then wipe out the Electrode and receive the HM for Whirlpool from Lance. The team is in good shape, and it's time to tackle the Mahogany Gym. We make our way through the gym without much difficulty and meet Price. His team is made up of Seal, Dugong, and Piloswine. I let off with Muscle, because in my head, Seal was Paradise for some reason. He's obviously not, but luckily we had a flinch and a critical hit to make it past his first Pokemon without getting hit. We land another crit on Dugong, which is a nice bit of luck, even if both moves had a higher critical hit ratio. Finally, One Surf takes down Piloswine to earn us our 7th badge. When we leave, we get a call from Professor Elm telling us to check out the Radio Tower in Goldenrod. First, we're going to head through Ice Path, because we have something pressing to do in Blackthorn City. The most frustrating part of this playthrough was honestly the lack of repels. Running into wild Pokemon every few steps can get a little annoying. The ice path is home to the HM for Waterfall and a bunch of expensive items that I can't use. Also, apparently our bag was full so I couldn't even pick them up. It didn't take long to make it through the cave, and once we reach Blackthorn, it's time to visit the move deleter. We can now delete and reteach HMs to restore PP and make grinding easier. As long as we're facing Pokemon we can one-shot, we can keep leveling up slowly. During this lengthy training session, we ran into Entei and actually did a bit of damage with Daya. A bit later on, she reaches level 28 and evolves into Marowak. Then, while leveling up Varia, we ran into Raikou again, but it fled before we could do anything. Anyway, this is where we stood after the grind. Everyone but Jebediah is up to at least 30, so the team is much more usable. Daya and Muscle have both taken a fair amount of damage, but everyone else is fine. 
We've also beaten most of the trainers in the radio tower, so we're now ready for a battle with the rocket executive. I'd love to use Varia here instead, but we still don't have a psychic move, so instead we're going with Magnolia. She's high enough level to one-shot all of the coughings and wheezing with Surf. With the executive beaten, we get the keys and head underground. The first trainer we come across is Silver. He's keen to end our challenge run right now, but with our extra grinding we're in good shape to take him on. His goal bat that leads off is no match for Magnolia, who manages to knock him out with one Surf. Next up is Magnemite, but it goes down to die as Bone Morang before it's even realised where it is. Silver sends out his Meganium next, and Kenya comes in on our side. One fly takes him down below half health, but his body slam paralyses Firo. A second slam knocks Kenya into a dangerous range, but he manages to break through paralysis and land a fly to take out Silver's starter. Now that he's paralysed though, we probably won't be able to grind him up anymore until we're healed. Silver's penultimate Pokemon Haunter gets off a curse, but ultimately goes down to one Bone Morang. Sneasel is our final opponent, but he gets absolutely polaxed by Muscle's four times effective Karate Chop. The team is really coming together now. We rescue the director and then take down the rest of Team Rocket in the radio tower. With Johto now free of evil teams, it's time for one last grinding session before going after our eighth and final gym badge. Other than Magnolia, the team is a little underleveled to take on Claire. This training session was basically just Varia and Muscle running into the legendary beasts. The goal was just to get Daya, Muscle, and Varia up to 36, mainly just so we could finally use Espeon. At 36 he learned Psybeam, and now we can actually deal some serious damage. We're now ready to battle the Blackthorn Gym Leader and earn our final badge. Claire's team is made up of three Dragonairs and a Kingdra. We go with Magnolia, and her first Dragonair goes down to two hits after getting off one Dragon Breath. We get lucky against Dragonair number two as Thunder Wave fails to paralyze for Alligator, and we take her out in two hits as a result. A Crit Slash one-shots her final Dragonair, leaving only Kingdra. It takes a few hits to knock her out, but we get through the final Johto Gym battle without losing a single Pokemon. We have to go through Dragon's Den before Claire will give us the Rising Badge though. Before entering, I put Jebediah in the PC because once we complete the challenge, we can speak to the Elder and receive a Dratini. This is necessary for us to get to the Elite Four at Indigo Plateau. None of our current Pokemon can learn Waterfall, so we need Dratini to get through Tojo Falls. We name our new team member Draka, and then get down to grinding. We can just use Surf and Waterfall along with the move to leader to grind up without losing any health. After quite a while, we take down a Graveler to level up to 30 and evolve Draka into a Dragonair. The team isn't in the best of health right now, but we're at a decent level at least. Luckily, we don't have to take on a single trainer before our next pre-heal. In fact, by making it to this woman's house, we've essentially completed our challenge. We can come back and heal here whenever we want, so as long as we don't lose any battles, we're in the clear. That said, we can't heal up at all between the Elite Four members, so we need to be careful. With the free heal right next to us, it's easy to take out all of the trainers and grind everyone up to the low 40s. Then we can breeze through Victory Road and take out Silver for the final time. Unfortunately, our rival doesn't come close to posing a threat. Unfortunately for him at least. The only thing he really accomplished was poisoning Kenya with Meganium, but now that we can heal, it's not a big issue. This battle wasn't difficult, but as I said, we've completed the hardest part of this challenge. Once we've healed, we get back to leveling up the team. Draka got the most training and eventually evolved into Dragonite. For the Elite Four, we got Daya, Kenya, Muscle and Baraya up to level 50, and Draka and Magnolia up to 55. This may seem like overkill, but I can't afford to lose here. If we lose a Pokemon against Will, they're gone for the next four battles. If Kara knocks out Magnolia, we can't use her against Lance, so we're playing it safe. I don't want to fail this challenge after all the hard work. Okay, let's get started with Will. The Psychic type member of the Elite Four has two Zatus, a Jinx, a Slowbro, and an Executor. Draka decimates Will's team without taking a hit. It's possible that I went a touch too far with the levels. Let's move on to Koga and see if he can do any damage. The former Fuchsia City Gym Leader has an Ariados, a Faratress, a Muk, a Venomoth, and a Crobat. Once again, Draka cuts through a couple of Pokemon, but Faratress does at least get spikes up before Dragonite's tiny wings knock him out. We switch into Varia for Koga's last three Pokemon, and although he takes damage from spikes, Psychic is enough to one-shot Muk, Venomoth, and Crobat. Bruno is up next, and I suspect he won't enjoy facing Espeon either. 
His team is made up of the three Hitmons, Top Chan and Lee, an Onyx, and a Machamp. The only one of his Pokemon to actually get a hit in was Hitmonchan, who did land one Mach Punch before going down to Psychic. Bruno is defeated, and we're moving on to the final member of the Elite Four, Karen. Her team of Dark-type Pokemon only features three Dark-types, along with Vileplume and Gengar. In fact, the Elite Four and Champion get worse at staying within their own specialty as you go on. Will has managed to assemble a team full of Psychic types, Koga's Faratress and Bruno's Onyx are both outside of their type specialties, Karen has two incorrect typings, and half of Lance's team of six aren't Dragon-type. Honestly, I wish they would mix things up more with their teams. It can get a little tiresome to battle trainers with single type teams. Anyway, Karen goes down while we let Muscle, Kenya and Daya join in on the fun. Finally, it's time to face off against Lance. His team is made up of three Dragonites, a Gyarados, an Aerodactyl and a Charizard. Varia was able to knock out his first two Pokemon before going down to a Hyper Beam. After Draca and Magnolia take out a second Dragonite and Aerodactyl, Lance's main Dragonite almost knocks out Draca. She just about survives on 3 HP though, and takes him out, leaving just Charizard. One Surf from Feraligator ends the battle and rolls the first set of credits. We need to go after Red before we're officially done though. As we can freely heal on Route 26 now, you don't need to see how the team is getting on all the time. The SS Aqua is a quick run of battles with yet another free heal aboard, so let's skip on to the Kanto Gym battles. They're all massively underleveled, so we can just speed through all of this. Janine's levels are particularly comical, with none of her Pokemon even reaching level 40. All of the first seven gym leaders got crushed, but I thought Blue would be a tough test, as his Pokemon are slightly higher leveled than ours. I guess I was wrong though. Although his team gets a few hits in, they aren't able to knock out any of our team members. Once we earn all eight Kanto gym badges, we head to Pallet Town and talk to Professor Oak. He arranges for Mount Silver to be open to us, and then checks our Pokedex saying that he sees that we understand how to use Pokeballs. Seems a bit weird as we've never used any, but whatever works for him. Then Red's mom basically tells us that he's an awful son, so that's good. We obviously have to grind up a bit before facing Red, but attempting to train at Mount Silver doesn't go very well. Instead, after healing at the house south of Victory Road, we just finish our leveling there. We get everyone up to 60, except for Draka, who we leveled up to 65. Daya's moveset is made up of Bone Meringue, Thrash, Strength, and Bone Rush. Varia has Psychic, Flash, Morning Sun, and Psybeam. Muscle's got Low Kick, Strength, Vital Throw, and Cross Chop. Kenya's moves are Drill Peck, Pursuit, Mirror Move, and Fly. Magnolia finally learned Hydro Pump to go along with Surf, Slash, and Strength. Finally, Draka has added Outrage to his moveset in place of Dragon Rage. With all of that out of the way, it's time to take on Red. Leading off is his Pikachu. At level 81 with Charm, Quick Attack, Thunderbolt and Thunder, the Pokemon mascot isn't much of a challenge for Daya. I was expecting him to start out with Charm, but instead he goes for a weak Quick Attack. Marowak's Bone Meringue is easily powerful enough to knock Pikachu out. Next up is a level 77 Venusaur with Sunny Day, Giga Drain, Solar Beam, and Synthesis. We send out Kenya, who doesn't really need to worry about any of Venusaur's moves. Two Drill Pecks wipe him out before he can even get off a Solar Beam. Red's level 77 Blastoise is up third, and it's the first opponent who we don't have a super effective move against. Without any obvious options, we send in Varia to take him on. With Rain Dance, Surf, Blizzard, and Whirlpool, Blastoise has super effective moves to deal with Draka, Kenya, and Daya. Espeon just seemed like a safe choice. Psychic chips away about 40% of his health before he uses... Whirlpool. For some reason. If he'd gone with Surf, then this would have been a coin flip, but instead Varia is able to knock Blastoise out pretty easily. Red is so inspired by Varia that he sends in his own Espeon next. Again, we don't have a great counter here, so we just go with Draka. Red's Espeon is level 73, with a moveset featuring Psychic, Swift, Mudslap, and Reflect. We're able to take advantage of Espeon's weak defense with Wing Attack before Psychic can take us out. Second to last for Red is his level 75 Snorlax. This is another easy choice, we opt for Muscle to take him on. Machoke outspeeds Snorlax and lands a Cross Chop which deals enough damage to take him out in two. Snorlax goes for Amnesia, which really makes no difference to us, but unfortunately Muscle misses her second Cross Chop. That allows Snorlax to use Rest and heal himself up. 
I wanted to make sure we got a hit in this time, so I went for Vital Throw, but Snore hit for decent damage and we fall just short of taking out half of Snorlax's health. With the Sleeping Giant about to wake up, we have to go for Cross Chop and hope it lands. Muscle hits and takes Red down to just one Pokemon, Charizard. The level 77 Fire Flying type has the moves Flamethrower, Slash, Wing Attack and Fire Spin. By switching into Magnolia, we've now used all six members of our team in the climactic battle with Red, so that's pretty cool. For Alligator is perfectly fine with taking a couple of flamethrowers to get off two surfs and win the battle. Red flees and we have officially gotten revenge for his mom. Before the credits roll again, we do have something important to do. After retrieving the mail from our PC, we find the so-called chubby man on Route 31 and hand Kenya over. I can only imagine his owner will be a bit confused when Kenya is returned to him as a level 60 Fero. With our last task completed, we can let the credits roll and officially say, you can beat Pokemon Crystal without using items or Pokemon centers. This was a challenge that I thought was destined to fail. I knew we'd get close to Mahogany, but I wasn't sure we could do it. Finishing a Pokemon game without using items or Pokemon centers doesn't feel like it should be possible, but apparently it is. If you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.